Anyway, yes, you've already heard this part, so uh, I'd like to pay my respects to, to, to the uh, Wajik people. So this is a homecoming to me. This is my second time speaking at Yao Perth. This was me in 2016. It was then called Yao West. Um, was anyone in the room actually at this event? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, yes, so uh, Yao was actually only the second ever conference I'd ever been to speak at. And I had done a program at the time Yao was running called New Voices in Tech where I had some speaker training. Um, but anytime, if you see people up here on stage and you think that that is something you might like to do, uh, you should have a look around. I know DDD does some new speaker training as well. Amy was doing that last night. I can honestly say that I owe a lot of my career um, to getting involved with speaking at events like this. So please have a look and, and look at what uh, training and avenues of coaching you have because really I owe my career uh, getting to Canva, getting to AWS, a lot of it goes back to, to being a good public speaker and some of the training that I received. And so now I can't see what slides next, so this is going to be a fun adventure for us. Um, I'm going to cheat. Yes, so one of the things I said, <laughs> I'm actually here, as I said, I'm not going to talk about AWS stuff. I'm actually here to correct a historical wrong because one of the things I said at Yale West 2016 was I stood on stage and I said, I hate interviewing. And the talk I was giving was about making that move from being a developer to being uh, more of a people leader. And look, I started my career as a developer 20 odd years ago. Um, I did a stint as a business analyst for a while before I moved into being a people leader and a team manager. And when I stood at Yale West 2016, I said, I hate interviewing. It's the worst part of my job. It's disruptive. I don't feel like I'm good at it. And I had been doing it since the very first job. I remember my very first developer job Six months into it, they went, great, you seem to know what you're doing. Go interview this guy and tell me if he can do what he knows what he's doing. And I had had zero training. Um, and I did this over the course of my career. I kept getting asked to interview people, and I had no idea how to do it. Have any of you been in that same situation? A lot of us, right? Uh, fast forward to like 2015. I was working by that point for MI9, which was Channel 9 over in Sydney. I was actually running the team that built their catch-up TV app. I was a hiring manager now. Like I had to make the decision whether or not to hire people, which was really scary. I had this horrible feeling like I was getting it wrong all the time. We, did, we agonized over our technical tests. We would give people this technical test to do before we would interview them. And then we found out that someone put all the answers on Stack Overflow. And like it was really, really horrible. And what are we going to do when we tried out different things? And I just had this suspicion that I was just not doing it well, and I hated doing it. Uh, a year later, I was at Canva. And look, Canva, bless them, were a very small startup back then. I remember my interview, they were like, why don't you, um, let's say you write up like features if you we were going to sell like a pro subscription -y thing. And I was like, okay, cool, I'll do that, do that. And they went, great, you're hired, build that, please. And I was like, whoa, really? You thought that was real? I made all that up. And so one of the things I did with them was, was start to look at hiring practices because, again, none of us had been trained on how to do this. I know that over the years, and if it, any of you I interviewed you, I'm sure I asked you questions that I should not have asked you. I probably didn't ask you the questions you wanted me to ask you. And I feel like whether or not I made good hires was down to a coin flip. And we keep doing this as an industry uh, to people. And my friend, uh, t my friend Ted Tenza, who many of you know over in Sydney, he says the idea that once you know how to code, you know how to interview to find out if other people know how to code is perhaps the second biggest fallacy in our field. Um, the first is that if you know how to code, you know how to lead other people who code. And the thing is, there's a lot more leadership training than there is interviewing training. And interviewing, I always felt, one part of the reason I felt really bad about it is because it makes such a big difference to people's lives. You know, if you're going to give someone a job, their first job maybe, it's such a big thing. And it's hard to get it right and feel like you know what you're doing a good job. And I really resonated with Katrina's talk yesterday about intuition. Um, I, I, I felt like I didn't have good hiring intuition. And I really wanted to develop that. And then you heard, I moved to Germany in 2020. I decided 2020 was going to be my year, was going to go to Europe. So that all was my fault. Sorry about that. And I expected Germany to be like this. Um, but in reality, it was more like this. I spent six months sitting in front of my computer. I knitted several sweaters. Uh, but I decided that when I was in Germany, um, damn it, I was going to crack interviewing. 
finally. Like, what else am I going to do, okay? I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And look, Amazon uh, had some training. Like, in order to do interviews, you had to go through this one-day training. We call it making great hiring decisions. But it's basically around what not to ask. And you might think that's obvious, but what I learned when I did that is in different cultures especially, uh, people would ask things that in Australia we would never ask them. How old are you? Do you have family? Things like that that you really shouldn't ask. So it was mainly around that sort of thing, and they did give some guidance as to how you should interview people. But again, I didn't feel like it made me a good interviewer. It just made me not a bad interviewer. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm finally going to crack interviewing. I did every bit of training that we had. You know, We had extra training you could do online. I did all that stuff. And unknowingly, I did the thing that Katrina said. I started shadowing people. I started shadowing people that I thought were good at it and just learning from them. And, and taking notes and trying to see if I, I would make my own notes and then see if I agreed with them on whether or not we should hire that person. And then I would get their advice. And a lot of the times, look, people gave me conflicting advice. Uh, not everybody's a good interviewer. Um, you know, there's so many people in their industry. I was talking to someone last night who see interviewing as a hazing ritual. I made it through it. Therefore, I'm going to put you through hell too, right? I knew I didn't want to do that. And so over time, over doing all this, over shadowing people, over making notes, over doing training, I actually got to the state where I've done nearly 300 interviews now at Amazon. I can say that I actually love interviewing. I, I, I don't find it as disruptive anymore. I have built a number of tools and mechanisms for myself that make it not suck. And my goal is that when you leave here today, you can take at least one of them and make it not suck for you. Okay? Uh, so, yeah, without having to do 300 interviews. I don't want anybody to have to do that. All right. What is the goal of all this? Well, the goal of my company is to hire the best candidate with long-term potential to grow. I mean, look, you might be just trying to hiring a contractor for a short period of time. That's a different story. If you're hiring a full-time employee, you want to get someone who can do the job, who isn't a jerk, who is, has long-term potential, right? That's what they want. And we have tenants. I actually looked this up on our wiki. Our, our hiring org has tenants. Our recruiters do about things like um, offering a good customer experience. Because guess what? We're Amazon. If you interview for us, you're probably going to buy something from us someday. We don't want you to hate that experience. So we want to make sure that even if you don't get hired, it's not a terrible experience. We want to make sure we're uh, being fair. Um, we want to experiment. We want to just not accept that the way we've done things in the past is good enough. So we actually do experiment with how we interview people. Um, and we want to build tools and mechanisms, guardrails in place that make this easier for people. So that's all the company's goal. My goal is, yeah, yeah, all that, but also make it painless, right? Make it not suck for me. Make it as easy as possible, not as disruptive as possible. So all the stuff I'm going to share with you today covers, we're just going to go through it, the four phases, before the interviewer, before the interview, interviewing, uh, making a decision, and some pro tips. And look, most of this I'm going to talk about from the view of a hiring manager, a person who's interviewing, but also as the interviewee. Because we're coming through this really weird time now where, look, I just did my first interview in several months. A lot of companies have had a bit of a hiring freeze on, maybe have even let people go. We're now, I'm happy to see, starting to see, uh, especially in Australia, starting to see some movement again. So it's a good refresher time for all of us, okay? If you're not doing interviews now, you probably will be in the very near future. So before the interview, let's talk about job descriptions. Job descriptions are uniformly terrible. You know it and I know it. Um, they're really hard to write as a hiring manager. I've worked with some of my colleagues. I used to be in the Solutions Architecture Org at AWS before I joined DevRel. And we're really trying to get away from having it not be just a list of bullet points. Um, one thing you can try is shoot a video. What's a day in the life of this role look like? Um, we've experimented with things like uh, putting a, a list of different tasks and saying, if you can do six of these, we want to hear from you. Because yes, there's that apocryphal story that people won't apply unless they meet all of the criteria. Um, so we're trying to get away from that. So include information about the day-to-day -day activities. Obviously, watch your language for bias. And there are tools. If you don't know, there are automated tools that can do this. You know, And we share this. I don't know if all of you guys know that. If you see a job description that's like, every pronoun is he, and the right guy will do this, we share that. And we tell each other to never work for that company again. Um, so watch for that stuff. Uh, 
And this one is from Ted. Consider writing a success profile. Um, what this means is in six months, we want the right candidate to be able to write an API, to be able to do this task. So it makes it a bit more about the potential, about the learning, not about what they can do right now. In six months, we expect them to do this. And that's really useful to have for the people who are going to be interviewing this person. It's also really useful to have for the hiring manager to actually know six months down the track if you made the right call or not. And I was really excited to hear yesterday Michelle's talk, because if you have a career development framework, um, a lot of that can actually inform your job description. So as an interviewer, if I get asked to help interview a role, first thing I'm going to ask for is, can you share the job description with me? And which of those things are showstoppers and which aren't? Because they're not all. Nobody meets all of the criteria. We know that. Nobody does. And as a candidate, I'm going to look at that job description and know that I don't need to meet every single one of the items on there. You really don't. So please don't let that put you off. Um, if you see the bad language, if you see that, that's a red flag. So that's just what I would tell you to do is watch out for the ones with the red flags. As a hiring manager, you're going to get a lot of CVs to review. My advice is just do them as they come. Don't let them pile up. Set aside time to do this. Uh, one thing that's really helpful is obscuring the names. Some people put photos on their CVs. I would not advise you to do that, um, but try doing them blind. They, there have been various studies that show that actually you will get more diverse candidates through if you do it blind. The, this one is tricky for me, looking people up on social media, because I hire developer advocates. We are those really annoying people who are always on stage, who are sharing things. I am that girl from LinkedIn. and so. I kind of want to look people up because they need to have that in this particular role. But if you're hiring an engineer, I would advise you potentially don't look them up because you're probably going to find out information that you shouldn't know, that you might not need to know. So unless it's part of their role, avoid stalking people on social media. And when you are reviewing the CVs, have specific criteria in mind. And this goes back to the framework. It goes back to the job description. Hopefully, you're reviewing them against a rubric. Also, as a hiring manager, you want to be really deliberate about your interview structure. The number one thing that I find really refreshing about the way we do interviews is it's a group decision. It's not one person making, making the decision. And so for a given interview, a, a senior developer, there might be five different people interviewing that person. So the first thing I want to do as a hiring manager is decide how many interviews, who's going to be doing it, what level of seniority do they need to have, what jobs are they going to be from, and the format. Are they going to be phone screens? Are they going to be in-person whiteboarding exercises? Uh, whatever format I need to have. And I want to make sure that person, again, keeping in mind, good candidate experience. It's not great for them to sit in a room for six hours without a break. Who's going to be taking them to lunch? Um, who's going to be actually showing them around and, 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 and making sure that they're, they're feeling OK? Um, I also want to cover who those interviewers are and what competencies they're going to cover. So we'll get into this. But hopefully, you're going to be reviewing candidates uh, according to uh, an objective set of criteria. We often at, at AWS, we use both functional competencies, so things like if they're an engineer, their coding ability, um, data structures and algorithms. But uh, for other people, it might be stakeholder management. It might be writing. Um, but we also use our values, our leadership principles, as we call them. And so we'll assign. So I might have five interviewers, and I'm going to assign each of them one or two different leadership principles that they're going to assess. And I'm going to assign a couple of those people functional competencies as well that they're also assessing in their interviews. And make sure everybody knows what they're covering. I'm also going to look at shadows and reverse shadows. So a shadow is when uh, I'm the experienced person. I have someone else sitting silently who's going to be shadowing me and learning from me. A reverse shadow is when it's their turn to practice. They'll be conducting it, and I'm the more experienced person, and I'm actually giving them feedback on how they do. But you want to be really clear on making sure everybody knows who are the shadows. We have rules. We generally say no more than two shadows um, on a candidate's interviews. Like You don't want them to feel like a thousands of people are being thrown at them. So it's good experience to limit that number as well. So again, as a hiring manager, you really need to put some thought into this. Those functional skills I mentioned, um, there's a reason we assign these. Yes, you need to be able to, to do the job. But by explicitly assigning, Amy, you're going to cover data structures and algorithms, all right? Uh, Chris, you are going to cover uh, coding, logic, and maintainability. Um, because if we don't, 
if we just assume people are going to cover them, well, guess what? They might get missed. All right. And also, uh, if we're going to do it for one candidate, we need to do it for all of them. So it ensures consistency um, and accountability. Because I've asked Amy to cover that. Guess what? She better cover that. One of the problems I find, not so much in the technical roles, but in the non-technical roles, is people will not assign any function. They'll just do the leadership principles. And actually, I've gone back and said, no, 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 no. Nobody on this, on this hiring loop is covering functional skills. You have to have that. Uh, and so I've pushed back on actual interviews I've been a fan. No, I, I don't care. They're an executive assistant. They need to be able to do expenses. They need to be able to manage uh, stakeholder relationships. You have to have something. So we, we actually enforce that now. We really push to make sure that a, an interview is a mix of both. Soft skills, these sort of glue, I guess, glue jobs, but also the func hard functional skills. And this last one here is one I struggled with hiring technical people, is these take-home exams that take people a lot of work. I used to feel terribly guilty about this because talented people might be able to knock something off in two hours, and it's no big deal to them. The ones actually that made me feel worse were the people who weren't going to get hired because it took them 10 hours to do it. But that was them spending 10 hours of nights and weekends um, and, and I felt terrible about it. I've worked on teams where we've experimented with different alternatives to this. Uh, what I had started doing when I was hiring solutions architects is really sort of front-loading a lot of the technical questions in the phone screen. I would put my most experienced interviewers on that initial phone screen to actually try and call that at the start to not waste people's time and to not waste our time. So really think about that. Think about having your best interviewer actually do that initial phone call because you'll, you'll find that we'll actually pay dividends for the rest of the team and it will stop people from spending lots of time when they're really not, they don't have much of a chance. The other thing we do, we do is when we do have these, we do have them for engineers, we do ask people to do a writing exercise for anyone in a leadership role. It doesn't, it's not a hugely involved thing, but what we do is in the interview, we actually have them go into that. So you might write a document about a given architecture, how would you improve this architecture? When you come into the interview, we're going to ask you to dive deep into that. All right, you said you would do this. Why would you do that? Can you tell me your reasoning for doing that? So it makes it still useful. It's actually a starting point for a conversation. It's where we got to at Canva, I was really proud of, is that we would, yes, we would do a coding exercise, but then when they came in, we would pair with them. And we would actually go deeper into that specific exercise. So if you're going to have people do it, make it worth their while, and make it something they're hopefully going to learn from. So as a, as a candidate, um, I think what I would say is, is if you have a an interview where they've asked you to spend an excessive amount of time with something, again, that's probably a, a red flag to be asked to do unpaid work for a job. It really limits the diversity of the candidates you're going to get. Um, it's just not a good thing to do. All right, and last bit before the interview. Uh, as a hiring manager, I send out a pre-brief. Um, and this is a term that might be unique to us. Uh, as an interviewer, I ask for this. I want to know, it could be a meeting or an email, but I want to know uh, what am I covering? What are the things you're looking for? So I saw your job description. Are you, do you really need every bullet point on that list? And also, even if I know your role well, are there any special asterisks I need to know? So yes, software engineer, I've hired them. But actually, this is going to be the first person in a new office. And they're going to need to be able to work unsupervised for a long period of time. And therefore, you really need someone who's got experience at a senior level. Or they're going into an office where there's 10 other people, and they're going to be able to get a lot of, a lot of help. That kind of stuff you really want to know. Um, reviewing previous feedback. So if they have had a phone screen, maybe the phone screener went, you know what, I think they ticked the boxes, but I sensed maybe there was uh, an error on databases where maybe they were a bit weaker. That's something that should be probed. Or I got an iffy feeling on this particular um, functional area, maybe dig deeper. Call that out. OK, this person said we, we need to dig deeper. Who's going to cover that? And be explicit. Who's going to cover the stuff? And the last one is sharing support requests. I've only come across this once or twice. But it's OK if, as a candidate, you, you have special needs. Um, perhaps you know, uh, uh, visually challenged. I've had a candidate who was neuroatypical who said, look, um, I might need a little bit more time for some of my answers, if that's all right. And that was 100% OK. Uh, they actually let the hiring manager know, and the hiring manager let all of us who were interviewing know um, that it was not 
to not introduce any bias, that we were going to be uh, making some accommodations for this candidate. Um, so that's a really useful thing to highlight as well. So that's all the stuff before the interview. All right, actual interview. You need to prepare and you need to source appropriate questions. And I have seen developers walk in to interview other developers where I watched a guy pull a crinkled sheet of paper out of his pocket and he'd used it clearly 50 times before and I was like, oh my God. Um, you know, one of, which, one of which was, what do you do for fun? Not appropriate. So I have a markdown file. I use Obsidian, but you know, whatever. You have a file where I have built a library of the questions that I ask for each of the competencies. Um, and so I've got that. I also, at the top, have some little patter of advice that I give candidates at the start of the interview. I leave that in. Um, I've got some icebreaker questions. And so whenever I have an interview, I duplicate this. I delete all the stuff I don't need. And then I've got that. And for each bit, I've got it set up in the format I like to take my notes. Um, so I use the STAR format, situation, task, action, result, or SBI, situation, behavior, impact. Um, however you like to organize your thoughts. But this is the single best thing you can do. If, if you have to interview and you don't have this, set it up. You might have a question bank in your organization. Um, we do. And I know that for those functional competencies, like for coding, data structures, uh, there might be standard questions that, that those job roles want you to ask. Uh, we even have, for those functional competencies, you have to actually um, be certified that you know what you're doing to assess other people for some of those competencies. So make sure you've got the questions. Make sure that you know what you're going to be asking them. And uh, review the candidate information. This is your call. I know some people who don't even like to read a CV before they interview a candidate. Um, I like to have a look at their CV. Mainly because like, if they start telling me a story of an example of one of their employers, it gives me a little additional context. Uh, it you know, makes it easier. I don't have to ask them many questions. But that's where you really, again, be wary of learning too much, things you shouldn't learn, and looking people up on social media. And this gets iffy, too, because sometimes someone I'm about to interview will stalk me. And look, as a candidate, I get it. You, you want to stalk the people who are going to interview, right? Um, don't send them a connection request before the interview. Like, that makes them feel weird. And, and maybe try to not make it too obvious in the interview that you have stalked them. Oh, Dave, you're from Ottawa. I've been to Ottawa. Oh, that's weird. That's a little weird. Too weird. The interview, the actual interview. Put people at ease. I like to actually, uh, would, do you need a little bit of a comfort break? I know you've been going for like two hours now. Do you want to take five minutes, get a glass of water? I'll be here. Um, make people feel at ease. If I'm the first one of the day, especially, I'm going to explain what's going to happen. I'm going to tell them, look, this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Pace yourself. You're going to have a number of interviews. This is the format we do. Um, we don't do trick questions. I'll let them know that. We're going to ask you to tell some stories. We use behavioral uh, questions. If you aren't used to that, it's tell me a time when. Um, and the thing I like about this type of question is it doesn't matter if people know the questions you're going to ask because they're telling you stories from their career. Tell me it's about a time when you had to make a decision without talking to your manager. Like, yes, prepare for that ahead of time. If you look up what our interviews are like, you can find a list of questions. Um, but what I want to hear is I want to hear uh, the candidate telling me those stories. So I explain them, how the interview format's going to work. I explain that, look, I have a really loud mechanical keyboard. <laughs> Sorry. I'm probably going to put it on mute while, uh, while you're talking because I type really loud. Um, I explain to them if there are shadows. Oh, this person here uh, is just shadowing today. Um, they won't be, they won't be uh, on screen or, or listening if it's a virtual one. I've started not saying whether they're more or less experienced than me. I don't want to necessarily tell the, the candidate whether I'm the least, less, or more experienced person, so maybe do that. Again, know the boundaries. Know what you can and can't ask and what you can and can't write down. Sometimes candidates will offer information that you don't want to have. Um, so I'll say, oh, thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm not going to write that down. It's not, really, it's not really super relevant to the question I'm asking. So, you know, family stuff or anything like that that I know is protected. Um, and I will share next steps with them at the end as well. So then I'm conducting the interview, and capturing feedback is tricky. I know for me, I type fast. 
Um, so I capture a lot. Other people I admire can do, and this is what I got from shadowing. I looked at how people took notes when they interviewed. Some people wrote a lot. Other people could just write a few salient bullet points and capture everything important. Um, I, I struggle with that. I have to type it all out. But I really look for numbers, scope, and impact. Um, if it's a senior role, I want to know about the impact of that change. Oh, great, you did that. How much time did that save your team? Oh, you implemented this, this change to your process. Did that, did that save money? And if you can say, yes, actually, that saved 15% that year. Wonderful. That's gold as a candidate. Anytime you can say numbers, really, really good. Um, asking probing questions. A lot of people will say, we did this. So my team, we, we implemented this new uh, CICD process and I say 15%. Cool, cool. What was your role on that team? What were the activities you personally did? And with some people, it's hard. Sometimes it's cultural. They tend to default to we because they're humble. Sometimes it's because they actually didn't contribute that much and they're obscuring that. So you need to really, we call it peeling the onion. Don't be afraid to ask probing questions. Okay, yes, you said your team too. What exactly did you do when you were given that task? What was the first step you did? Or how long did that take you to do? And so you really gotta sort of dig deep and don't be afraid to cut somebody off if they're going down a rabbit hole, um, giving you information you don't need. Okay, that's actually, I think I've got enough for this story. I'm going to move on. And I find, I actually find that if, if I get through two or three stories in an hour, that's enough, um, especially the more senior role. I'll expect you to give me an example that's got a lot of meat on it. If you're a student, of course you're not going to have. It's OK to repeat examples. I know sometimes people who are newer to the industry ask that. Look, I, I've only worked on three projects. Is that OK? It's absolutely OK. They will take that into account. But if you're a senior with 20 years of experience and you can only cite three stories to everyone on that, on that panel, we're going to be going, well, that's, that's very telling. You know, I would expect you to have a little bit more to draw on. So capturing feedback is really tricky. People want to know, oh, can I record this? Uh, everyone, every now and then someone at AWS is like, can I record this and use transcribe on it? No. No, you cannot. This is uh, personal information. We do not want to do that. Um, and you also uh, will get to it with writing feedback the information you capture about candidates is legally quite sensitive. So just be aware of that. You don't want to necessarily be capturing that stuff. You want to capture the salient points, those data points, and hopefully if you've prepared your template well enough with situation, task, action, you know, you can actually, I find that really helpful for organizing that. Cool, you said that this was the project you were on, you were assigned to do that, your actions were that. What was the result of that again? So what actual improved, because a lot of people leave off the result part. They'll tell you the whole story and they don't tell you the, the most important part. What's the result? What did that actually do for your business? So don't be afraid to get that. And if you're a candidate, what I would advise you to do is prepare your answers in this format, is actually before the interview. Think of the stories from your career you might talk about, but actually think about them and write them out ahead of time. You know, what was the situation? What did I do? What was the impact of that? You don't want to read them in the interview, like you don't want to okay, ask a question and they like, you can cl clearly tell they're like going through multiple tabs. You want to be a little more natural than that, hopefully, but it's okay if you need to refer to some stuff, that's fine. Writing your feedback. Um, I, I have a phrase here I use, I work bottom up. So what I mean is I've got that markdown file where I've put all my notes from the candidate. I wait a few days. And this goes back to the intuition thing. Most of what I do as an interviewer is trying to get away from gut feel. Because guess what? Gut feel when you're talking about hiring people is mostly about biases. Um, I like people. I like meeting people. And so anytime I interview anyone, immediately afterwards, I'm like, they're great. I want to work with them. They're really cool. Unless they were an active jerk, I'm, I'm really predisposed to them. Um, I also, you know, oh, they look like the type of person I would expect to do that job. You, you don't say that, but you think that. And so I have to force myself to wait a couple days uh, before I put my feedback in. And by the time I do that, that initial impression is gone, and I'm looking at the data points that I've captured. So that's when I go and I put in the feedback. I know that some teams, um, and we have teams at AWS, who, who think, great, I'm going to like do a, a day where I bring in 10 candidates and we'll just speed interview them. And we'll, at the end of the day, we'll all get together and decide who to hire. I hate that. I've done it like twice. Yeah, you're laughing. It sucks. I, I don't 
I can't make a good judgment when I do that, so I've started turning those down. I don't think it's necessary. I get it why they do it, but I'm not the type of person who can interview, speed interviewing. So when I put my feedback in a couple days later, and I literally did this last night for an interview I did last week, um, I take my raw notes from Markdown, and we have a, a tool that captures this feedback. I paste them in, I format them, and I read, and I refresh my memory. Okay, okay. And then I've got a spreadsheet where for each of those competencies that I might be assigned, I've built this up over time, there are behaviors associated with that. So for things like um, one of our leadership principles is customer obsession, okay? Uh, it's things like listens to customer input, pushes back on something that isn't good for the customer. You know, it's like eight or 10 different things that sort of show that, and I will tick them off as I go through, because that helps me, again, divorce the emotion from it. Actually, they did five of the good things and none of the bad things. So I'm going to say that this is probably a strength for them. Like, as opposed to just, well, I like their story. I'm going to call that a strength. I'm trying to make it more objective. I'm trying to use a rubric. And I've shared this with people on my team as well, so that we're all working from this, this common uh, standard. So I do the raw notes, then I do each of the things I was assigned. So if it was um, a writing exercise, I will go and I'll review the writing and I'll do that. If it was, uh, for example, SQL or something like that, I'll review that and write that in. Then I go up to the top, I do a recap pros and cons. So sort of summary for the candidate, so I do that. And the very last thing I do is decide whether or not I'm going to click the hire button. Because usually by the time I've done that, I might have actually changed my mind from how I felt at the end of the interview. Uh, because of, actually, you know what, now that I dig into this, they didn't really get to where I wanted them to go as a senior. I would have expected a little bit more depth and impact in that example. And it's clouded by the fact that I really liked talking to the person or, you know, we clearly had things in common. No, you want to get away from all of that. Uh, avoiding biases is really important. Um, we don't put per, uh, proper names in our feedback tool. It actually will highlight it. They've done a lot of work on this. Um, if you write he, she, or the candidate's name, it will flag it before you submit it. So I write they. And it took me a while to get used to that, I'm not going to lie, but now it's very natural for me to do. The candidate said this, or TC, for the candidate. They did that. Because even though, look, everyone in that panel, in that group, interviewed the same person, they know who that person is. By divorcing it, you just, again, you make everybody aware of their biases, and it just makes it a little bit more objective. So avoid biases. These are legally discoverable. Notes you put in about a candidate can be discovered in a lawsuit. So just uh, make sure that you're not writing down things that you shouldn't be writing down. Um, and don't just recap. This is one of the things when I coach other people. It's a lot of people put in their interview feedback. It's just the candidate said this, and then they did that, and then they did that. You're the expert. Was that good? Like, you're a senior database administrator. Was their answer better than other people at that level doing the job right now? Was it not as good as other people doing the level? Like, it's not just a recap. I actually want your, your expertise. And so what I do when I put in my feedback is I'll, I'll write, the, I ask this question, candidate said that, where I felt this raised the bar was in that and that and that. What, what missed for me was that, that and the other. So be explicit about that. I force myself to write that, um, to actually acknowledge those things. Again, getting away from gut intuition, when you force yourself to actually say why it was a good answer or not. All right, debrief. Look, this is, of course, mostly relevant uh, to hiring managers. And if you're in an organization that, that does interviews as a group, great. Um, I know that in some orgs, like Google, for example, the people who interview are not the people who actually review on the hiring panel. Uh, at AWS, they are. Um, but regardless, if you're facilitating a debrief, if you're an interviewer, um, a debrief discussion is really useful. No matter how much the candidate might have bombed, <laughs> bombed the interview, we still spend 30 minutes discussing them to make sure we didn't miss something. Were, are they better for another role? And so it's really important. Um, and so one of the things I do when I do this is I make sure I get the opinions of the less tenured people first. Because if Dave Thomas is in there and I ask Dave whether or not we should hire this guy and he says, hell no, well, guess what? No one else is going to contradict him. So I'm going to start with maybe the, the less experienced people first, get their feedback, and eventually make my way up to the most senior person in the room. And 
I'm not going to just say, all right, so, uh, Michael, you were, you were uh, not inclined on hiring this candidate. Why was that? Well, I could read that. I read that in your notes. So, Michael, you said you felt that they didn't know um, that they weren't at the right level for database. What were you hoping to see that you didn't see there? So I try and ask questions to, to dig into your answers a little bit. Um, uh, you said that they were uh, at a, you know, principal level for this particular skill. Why? What made you say that? You know, really just sort of try and confirm that what they said the candidate was a strength was a strength. Uh, disconfirm, you know, um, mitigate any concerns. Oh, you said that was a concern. That actually wasn't noted as a showstopper for the role. So look, you're in that role. Is that something that's coachable? You know, it's always good to have those conversations as well. Like, yeah, the candidate's missing this, but we didn't say that was a showstopper. Is that actually a big problem? You seem to think it was, but the hiring manager said it wasn't. And so I do all of this. And hopefully, by the way, at this point, this is the first time everyone's seen everyone else's feedback. Like, we don't, our tooling actually prevents you from seeing the other people's feedback until yours is in. Um, because I really don't want to have one person come out of the interview like, <sighs> and that biases the next person. So really, you want to go into this discussion, hopefully, having everybody read the feedback and you're prepared to discuss it. And sometimes I've gone in where we're all ready to hire, and we come out with a no hire. Because we've realized that this person has uh, again, maybe a senior person used the same three examples for every interviewer. Um, maybe they said something to one interviewer that they blatantly contradicted in another interview. That would be bad. Uh, and Or you go in with it's all not inclined, and by the end you've talked yourself into the hiring the, the candidate. The last question here is the one that I really ask um, and I use as an interviewer. When I can tell a hiring manager really wants to hire somebody and maybe I'm, I'm iffy on them, what's your compelling reason to hire? And I really need a person in this role is not a compelling reason to hire. It needs to be because they bring a skill that our team lacks, um, because they are better than uh, a bunch of other people we already have who are doing this role. Um, they have this experience, this critical experience that we can't get in market. It needs to be something like that, not just because uh, my team's down someone and we really need somebody. So what is the compelling reason to hire? And so hopefully, if you're interviewing at a good at a good company, this is, this is what they're going to be doing. And one of the things that really comes out of it that's great to see is maybe you're not a hire for this role, um, but we've decided, you know what, maybe is this candidate someone that we want to recycle? Do we think they'd be better off in a better role? The other thing this does is a good quality check. If everyone was like, good God, no, how did that person get through the phone screen? Maybe this is a sign you need to go back and recalibrate whoever's doing your initial CV review, your initial phone screen. If it's green across the board, everybody wants to hire them, are we sure we aren't misleveling them? Maybe they're, they need to come in at a higher level than we've pitched them at. If we're all saying that they're like amazing, maybe we need to talk about that. So these are the kind of discussions you can have in that debrief as well. It's also a really good time to give people coaching on their interview feedback. So as a hiring manager, if someone who's done an interview, if I think someone's done a good job, I'll call it out in the debrief. Amy. I actually thought your, your feedback was really good and it really helped me uh, get a sense of the candidate, whether they're right for the job. If someone didn't do a great job, I'll ping them afterwards and say, hey, I, I know you're a bit new on, on doing this. I would suggest have a look at Amy's feedback. The way she structured it, um, she did a really good job with that. So call that out privately. Um, but you know, and, and also as an interviewer, look at other people's. Because I, I gained, this is a shadowing thing. I learned so much from looking at how other people structure the questions they use, how they're gauging whether or not this was a good candidate or not. So uh, a debrief is a really great coaching and learning opportunity for your interviewers as well. Oh, and that skipped ahead. Yes, coaching and feedback, yes. So privately coach people where they need it. Um, we, yeah, we have a lot of internal training for it, so you can also discreetly suggest that they perhaps do some of those. We do have some metrics. This is an interesting thing. Um, we do have SLAs for our interviews. Uh, this goes with the candidate experience. We have an SLA that after a phone screen will give you a yes or no within 
I think, five days. And when you do a proper interview within two days, our tooling enforces that. If I do an interview, I get emails every night saying, you have outstanding feedback you need to put in for this candidate. Um, so look at your tooling and actually enforce that. Because it, there's nothing worse as a candidate than just waiting. And if you know that there's an SLA, uh, that will be really helpful. It also helps us identify bottlenecks. If we know that this one team, the average time it takes to get from a CV to an interview is 47 days, that's too long. So we've built tooling and metrics that we can actually see dashboards around our hiring for each team, how long people take in different stages of the funnel. We also ask candidates, how did we do? Regardless of whether you get hired or not, we send you a survey after. Uh, if you are a candidate who has a bad experience, you should absolutely let them know. And I have had people interview at my employer and tell me shocking stories. I want to know that. Um, because I, if I don't know that, I can't try and make it better. Um, so please, if you don't do this to candidates you're interviewing, you should. It will help you identify, um, identify things you can do. Experiments as well. For example, one of the bits of feedback we acted on was people said, well, I didn't get to tell all my really good stories. I, I didn't feel like you asked me the right questions. So we're doing an experiment at the moment. The last interviewer on every panel has to ask an extra question. Uh, what's, what's one story you haven't gotten a chance to tell today that you would really like to be noted? Um, so we're trying an experiment, and we're seeing how it works. And that came purely from the feedback we got from people after their interviews. So if you're not doing this, you should try it out. And personal calibration. Chris and I were talking about this earlier. Um, I recently had someone reach out to me and say, hey, I helped you out in an interview panel for someone on your team six months ago. Are they still in role? Are they doing well? I'm just trying to calibrate. And I was like, what a good idea. Like this person is actually going and asking because they want to know, they want to develop that intuition was I right? Did I actually make the right call? I know that some orgs do this. I know that Google, for example, know, based on your interviewing history, they'll tell you how many people got hired or whether or not they're still in role X years later, I think. We don't have that, but some people take it on, on their part to do it. And I'm actually thinking about that I would like to do that as well. I'd like to know, of those 300 interviews I've done, how many of the ones that I said we should hire are still in role and are doing, doing well? A few pro tips, uh, managing your calendar. Because look, if you get good at interviewing, you're going to get asked to do more interviews. And so I've set an SLA for myself. I do two a week at most. Because look, it takes time. Even with my template, um, let's say it takes me 15 minutes to set up for an interview. The interview itself is an hour. It takes me at least one hour to put in my feedback. If you're really thinking about it and synthesizing it and doing it properly, another hour. You know, debrief. Pre an interview is about half a day you know, roughly in terms of disruption. So I don't do more than one or two a week, and I color them bright red in my calendar so I can tell at a glance, sorry, I'm a two that week. I can't do any more. Um, and don't be afraid to push back. So color your calendar. It's really helpful. Off-the-record chats. This is something if you're hiring, um, you, you, it's an experiment we tried where people would say, look, I want to ask people questions about the company, and I don't want to have it be part of the thing you're judging me on. And so, especially people from underrepresented groups. So we uh, introduced a program we call Candid Chats, where anyone who's interviewing can say, I'd, I'd like to do, we offer it to them. If they say yes, they get to have like an extra interview with someone um, from their group who they can ask questions to. It's not recorded. They're not part of the debrief. Um, it's solely so that they get a feel, what is it actually like to work in that role on that team as a person like me? Um, so that's something that I, I put my hand up to, to be a part of and might be something that would be useful to you and your company. Training and rewarding interviewers. Guess what? Like Michelle said, we make interviewing, uh, hire and develop the best is one of our leadership principles. We make that something you have to do to get promoted. If you're trying to get promoted to a senior or a principal engineer and you've done 10 interviews over the last five years, guess what? I'm going to be not inclined on that. Because I expect the higher you go, the more for you to help build the culture in the org, the more for you to help, um, help pay it back to other teams to maintain the hiring bar. So we explicitly call it out. Like it's actually required as part of your job. Uh, we do have training. We make a lot of uh, extra training available. As I said, some people take advantage of it. Some people wait until uh, pandemic to do it. But rewarding people is great, too, like swag and stuff like that for people who contribute. We have an internal uh, hiring conference where we share advice like this, stuff like that. So you can find ways to make it a little bit more interesting and fun. Um, and improving the candidate experience. Uh, again, I just 
want to make sure that this person has a good experience regardless of whether they get hired or not we do recycle people um, we do try and find them you know it's not unusual for people to get hired into a different role a year or two later and think about that think about how how do how are you how are they going to feel about your company afterwards um, so i think that's an underrated part of it is that this is, might be a customer for your product down the track and you want to make sure they have a good experience so we covered a lot of ground today. I talked about stuff before the interview, mostly relevant to hiring managers, but again, of interest to candidates who want to know what's going on behind the curtain. Um, we talked about interviewing. If you do nothing else and you're an interviewer, start setting yourself up a standard template, um, build out competencies that you feel comfortable you are a good judge of and using an objective set of criteria every time for candidates to be consistent. And when you write your feedback, uh, I would advise start getting in the habit of, of starting to write about them in an objective way. Don't encode your biases into your feedback. If you are a hiring manager, make sure that when you're making decisions, you're, uh, you're using a, a set of objective criteria, hopefully going back to the job description, capturing metrics around that, and capturing feedback from the people you're interviewing. And again, um, yeah, having a good, oh, that was a good one. The, the last candidate experience one is again from Ted. Ted's the unspoken. He gave a similar talk, I believe, at the leadership uh, session last week. But Ted suggested a great idea that I want to try out, which is sort of having a candidate pack that we would give them at the start just to fully prep them and make sure that they don't feel like we're trying to haze them or pull the rug out from under them, make sure they really know what they're getting into. So a lot of stuff. Uh, the one slide of spooking, this is what my team does, um, but you all know that because it's just AWS and Goose is did a fun, fantastic job today. Um, and that's me. Thank you very much.